I want to talk to you today about something that has been in my mind. It's uh, Zechariah chapter 4, if you have your Bible. Zechariah chapter 4, one of the, the last books in the Old Testament. Uh, the, the one before the last, you have Malachi. And then just before Malachi, Malachi is the last book in the Old Testament. One before Malachi is Zechariah chapter 4. I, I was reading my notes. Uh, although I'm not really organized, I do have some notes. And, uh, and I think I... I I had an exposition of this sermon maybe two and a half years ago, two and a half years ago here at the church, so maybe some of what I'm going to say, you say, oh, I've heard this before. Um, but I want to emphasize something different that caught my attention in this process of uh, revisiting the Bible from time to time, going over again and again, reading and rereading and, and taking something new uh, to my own life and I want to share it with you. So Zechariah chapter 4, it says like this. Then the angel who talked with me returned and awakened me as a man is awakened from his sleep. He asked me, what do you see? I answered, I see a solid gold lampstand with a bowl at the top and seven lights on it, with seven channels to the lights. Also... There are two olive trees by it, on uh, the right of the bowl and the other on its left. I asked the angel who talked with me, what are these, my Lord? And he answered, do you not know what they are? No, my Lord, I replied. So he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might, not by power, but my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. What are you, O mighty mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you will become level ground. Then he will bring out the cap capstone to shouts of God bless it, God bless it. Then the word of the Lord came to me. The hands of Zerubbabel uh, have laid the foundation of this temple. His, his hands will also complete it. Then you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. Who despises the day of small things? Men will rejoice when they see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. These seven are the eyes of the Lord which range throughout the earth. May God bless his word as we put our hearts in reflection upon it. So you know the story, and I'm going to briefly, uh, just for time's sake, say it to you. Uh, after the, the, the kingdom of Israel became a, a powerful kingdom with Saul first, and then David, and then Solomon. Solomon was the, the third and last king of Israel as an united nation, Solomon. After Solomon, there was a split and the kingdom was divided into northern kingdom with ten tribes. Ten tribes in the north and two tribes, Benjamin and Judah, in the south. All right? And for many years, a hundred years-ish, uh, these uh, two uh, kingdoms, they sort of, uh, they had to work together somehow. In the northern kingdoms, they had less spiritual kings. The southern kings, seven probably, were good kings. They were trying to do what was right before the Lord. But then, the northern king was invaded and completely destroyed roughly 600 before Christ. 700 before Christ. Completely destroyed the northern kingdom. Even to this date, doesn't exist anymore, the northern kingdom of Israel. It was called Israel. The southern kingdom was called Judah. Then, in the year 600 and... and 97-ish, 697, Babylon invaded the southern kingdom and destroyed everything and took them captivity into Babylon, where's current-day Iraq. So there, according to the prediction and the prophecy, prophecy of Isaiah and Jeremiah, who lived way before that, Isaiah and Jeremiah, they prophesied, saying, you're going to go to captivity. And you're going to remain there 70 years, 7-0. Seven 
And there you go. They stayed in captivity, in exile for 70 years. 70 years. And, and then also Isaiah. And you have to think this is God. Isaiah prophesied that sometime later, a servant of the Lord, and his name was Cyrus, he would free the people from exile so they could come back. And exactly like that, around the year 539, 539, uh, roughly 50,000, 50,000 of these men and women left Babylon and they went back to Jerusalem. And they had a mission. Their mission was to rebuild the temple. And you can read it, and we read Esdras and Nehemiah and Esther, and when you see Haggai and, and uh, those other minor prophets, they all will tell the same story, okay? So Nehemiah was later, later in the days when he had to rebuild the walls around the city of Jerusalem. But first was the temple. And one man was charged with this responsibility. His name was Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel was an heir somehow from the house of David. And he was in charge of rebuilding this temple. The beautiful, massive, gorgeous, marvelous temple of Solomon that took Solomon 183,000 men, 183,000. Thousand men to build this marvelous temple in seven years, nonstop, 24 7. They worked every single day and night, taking turns, almost 200,000 men. And not only that, he had almost 1,300 engineers and architects, all of them in charge of building the temple. More than that, Solomon was the richest man on earth. So he had everything he needed. He had power, had money, wealth, resources, had slaves, had people. He had agreement with all the nations so that all of them could send Solomon the best, the best gold and wood and stones and everything. So it was 13 years, this beautiful, majestic temple of Solomon was right there, built. Nothing ever seen like anymore after the destruction. In a pile of rubble, a pile of stones, everything in smoke and dirt. After 70 years, they were still there, still waiting to be rebuilt. So God takes this 50,000 men. You have to understand, they were about 1.3 million people. 1.3 million people in Babylon captivity. But God takes 50,000, 50,000, and they walk all the way to Jerusalem. And they have one mission, to rebuild this massive temple of Solomon. They can do it. Their minds are slaves. Most of them, they were born in captivity. They never seen the temple before. The only thing they had in mind was the record of slavery, nothing else. They didn't have money. They didn't have a bulldozer. They didn't have tractors. They didn't have dynamites. The stones were massive, were big. They didn't have engineers to do it, architects. Just a bunch of former slaves with the task of rebuild, simply the most Marvelous construction building ever built. This is it. So they can do it. So they start. Slowly they start, and Zerubbabel is the leader. And the first thing he does is, okay, we have to build the foundation. So they take a stick and they drew in on the ground, just like that. Well, you know what? This will be the foundation. And imagine you have this massive temple, Solomon, and now the foundation of the new temple is probably no bigger than this temple of ours. So small, so small. When they saw it, the Bible says, when they saw the foundation, they began to cry, especially those who were older, older than 70, 80, 85, 90, because they saw the temple of Solomon. 
So now they saw what? I saw that, and now this, this little thing will be the new temple? You've got to be kidding. And the Bible says in the book of Hosea that they began to cry and weep and weep and cry and cry and cry, and no one else could actually find strength to build it. They can't do it, build it. They got discouraged, disheartened, and they couldn't do it. They gave up. For two entire years, nobody worked in the foundation of the temple. Not only that, because they were not working, they decided, well, let's build our houses. So all of them began to work in their own private houses, working their houses, working their houses. So now there's a big distraction. No more temple. We're going to build our houses, our homes. And maybe in your mind, there's a question mark saying, what's wrong with that? You have to understand, in the Old Testament theology, and, and everything the same for us today, God would abide, he would dwell, he would live in the temple. So if you want to prosper in your life, you need the blessing from God. But where this blessing will come from? From the temple. So you cannot have an inversion of priority. First, you care for the temple. God will come and abide in there. And then you go and build your houses, your home, and it will be beautiful. And you're going to be blessed. The prophet says that. He says, do you know how you go for hunting and you come back empty-handed? Do you know how you get your money and you can buy anything with it? There's no blessing upon you. Because you did it the other way around. You first you took care of yourself, and then you took care of, to, to, took care of my presence. But it has to be different. First things first. Jesus says, you seek first my kingdom. And then there's a promise. Everything else I'll take care of. Either we believe that, or we don't. So they, they didn't. So they got discouraged, they got distracted, and not only that, there were enemies of the land. A number of them, the Bible says, you read especially in the book of Esdras and Nehemiah, they didn't want Israel back. So they began to have plots, even with the king of Babylon, or Syria now, and say, no, we can't do it, they can't do it. And now they begin to... to plan strategies so that they could uh, stop the Israelites to build the temple and to build the walls and their homes and become a country again. So a lot of problems here. And then Zerubbabel is the leader, and he is discouraged. He says, there's nothing happening here. Am I leader of what? Nothing, because nothing is happening. So Zechariah is the prophet. And he is asleep. And the an angel, the Bible says, wakes him up and says, I have a vision for you. And he presents to Zechariah a vision. And the vision is like this, a lampstand, a menorah, a lampstand made of gold with seven branches like this, and light all over, and on top of it, a bowl, a reservoir, and then, side by side of this lamp stand, there's two olive trees. This is what he sees. Two olive trees, a lamp stand, and seven lights coming from them. And these lights were connected to the olive trees. And then the angel says, do you understand what you see? He says, I don't. So let me say this to you. This is the word of the Lord. And this is what you have to understand here, Zechariah. I want you to talk to Zerubbabel. I want you to encourage him. And this is what I want him to know. First of all, I want him to know the overwhelming source of power and strength that I am for my people. So in the temple of Solomon, there were light, ten light sticks on the wall, against the wall. 
And before that, in the tabernacle of Moses, also there was one big light. And always there's supposed to be lighting there. And this was a, a sign to the people of Israel, you are to be light of the world. You have to shine. You have to be bright. And the world has to see you. And as long as I am your God, there, will, there has to be light in this menorah. But the difference now from Zechariah, when the first time this menorah figure appears, is that now there's a, a bowl, a reservoir, full of olive oil, and then there's a tube coming from two olive trees that go up to the, the, the reservoir and constantly, constantly brings oil to the menorah. Why oil? Because oil was the, the fuel that they needed to keep the light on. So the priest of the temple or those who worked in the tabernacle before, they would have to go time and time again and fill the oil. And then they would go back and someone would say, oh, the, the, that light is, is dimming, it's, it's, it's quenching the fire. So someone will go there and put more oil. And they would go and put more oil and more oil and more every time, every day, every day, more oil. But this is different. No one else has to put more oil in it. The light is right there, the fire is on, and the light is, is coming everywhere. You, everybody can see the light that Israel produces to the world. But the difference this time, and he has two unstoppable olive trees. And from olive trees, you have olives, and from olives, you have oil. And then there you have the continuous flow of few coming to that, that lampstand. He says, we'll never lack fire in my house again. My house will never miss one single day without my presence. My spirit will be dwelling in my house every single day, and nobody has to come and, and do it for you and do it for you. I myself, I am putting the few inside of you, and I am the few. I am the oil, I am the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and I'll be bringing this to you again and again. Every single time you are deeming your faith and, and being very weak, the oil will come in your life and set you in fire. We have to understand the, the, the power of this image. And I have been struggling personally in my own life about this. Because sometimes we try everything possible, thinking that we are doing the right thing. And maybe we are doing the right thing. But everything I say is just philosophy. Everything I say is just a good word of encouragement. Everything I say is just a good principle for your life. And everything I say is that you be a good father. You be a good brother. You be a good mother. You be a good citizen of Canada and Calgary. And then I'm just, I'm just cheering you up as a clown trying to motivate you, as a funny man trying to tell you the best joke, and maybe finding, I don't know where, the best wisdom I can give you so that you can be encouraged today. But this is not about the Bible. There's so many other funny people there, so many other who have words of encouragement, and they get a lot of money to do this, and they're way better than us. But this is not the church. The church is not about just principles for your life, the rules for you to live. This is not the church. The church, any, we're going to have a beautiful, as Marisa said, opening downstairs. How many, how many uh, uh, community centers have that? How many community centers have soup daily delivered to those who live in the streets? How many people help those? I just heard about a, a community People here now opening for pregnant women who want, to, they don't want their children. They just want to get rid of their children. So now they have a place to do it. So the world can do it. Other people can do it. There's something else about it. And the something else is the Holy Spirit. This is all the church has to understand. 
that we are fueled by the Holy Spirit. There's power in this for our lives. Otherwise, as C.S. Lewis says, we're going to just be an honest egg, a good egg, an honest egg. I do everything all right. But never I'll get wings and fly. Never, never, never get wings and fly. And then one day you die. You go bury your family. You're going to bury you. And someone will come up and build a beautiful speech about you. Oh, this was a good man. Oh, she was a, an honest wife. Oh, they worked so hard. Oh, this, everybody works hard. Everybody can be a good husband. Everybody can be a good wife. A good children. Good son, good daughter. It's more than that. It's about being alive. It's about understand life the way we should. It's changing the lenses of our life and see something different. We are so flooded with the, the lifestyle of the world that this is how we see the, 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 our lives according to the world. We see what is success according to the world, the principles of the world. And I never dream of a church that could be a just a good, nice, safe place for you to come and hear good advice for your life. Pay a good psychologist, uh, psych, psychology, whatever. He can say better than I. It's about life. It's about repentance. It's about understanding that we are dead without Jesus in our lives. That won't go anywhere. That there's something spiritual happening here right now. And maybe you never thought of it. You can't see it. You just see these white walls. And you see this pastor screaming, shouting. But you see nothing spiritual happening here. It has to be more. It has to be more. I'm not talking about crazy stuff. I've been around enough to know that I'm not talking about crazy stuff. I'm talking about looking into people's eyes and see that they are alive. They want something else in life. That I have to hold them instead of push, pushing them. Because they are alive. Think of uh, the fact that he says, I have a work for you to do, and I'm going to supply you with oil. And the oil is myself. I'm giving you my very presence. Think about it. In John chapter 7, there's the, the, the feast of the tabernacle. And Jesus is observing everything. And the high priest comes. And he pours water in the stairs to the side, the right side of the altar. And as he does that, that he says, the water going there. And Jesus says, I am the water of life. No religious thing. I am the water of life, and if you are thirsty, he says, you come to me and drink of me, and I will quench your thirst. It's quite interesting because this, you come to me, you drink from me, your thirst is, is a present tense verb, present tense. You coming, you drinking, and keep coming, and keep coming. And keep coming. Never don't come again. Why is that? Because we leak. We have holes. How Hosea says we, we, we lean towards the opposition of God. We tend to go away from God. And from time to time we leak. We have no nothing. We cannot, we cannot retain the Holy Spirit constantly powerful within us. We are sealed by the Spirit. But this is why Paul says we have to be continuously filled and filled and filled and filled by the Spirit. It's a continuous thing that you do through bending your knees before God in an act of faith and praying to Jesus, Jesus, would you fill my life? Would your Holy Spirit come and renew my strength and my joy and my desire to live and, and live a good life for you, for your glory? I don't want to waste my life. So this is, this is what we have to do. Continuously understand that God's presence is with us. And sometimes we just don't see it. The olive tree is right there beside you. The church, you are the light of the world. 
Let your light shine, Jesus says, so, so people can praise your Father who is in heaven as our light shines. We have to understand this. But we don't draw from the Spirit no more. We suck from something else, from people's experiences. And when was the last time we actually plead with the Spirit, the Spirit, that He would come and fill us, fill us. In 2 Peter 1, 3, the Bible says, God in His divine power, divine power has given us all that we need for life and godliness. Think about it. By His divine power, He has given us all that we need, all that we need but for life and godliness. And then you look at your life right now. Right now, look at your life. Look at your bitterness. Look at your depression. Look at your confusion. You don't know where to go, what to do. Look at your insecurity. Look at, look at it. Look at, be, be honest to yourself. This is a church. Think about it. Where's the joy? Where's the shouting? Where is it? Where's the bright beaming in your eyes when, when someone outside the church sees you in your work, in your school? Where's your compassion? Where's your prayer? Prayer life. Where's your devotion that you want, as the Bible says, eat this book, eat. So much that I love it. David says, I cry and there's a flood of water in my eyes because nobody loves your word anymore. This is David. He says, there's a flood in my eyes, he says, because nobody loves your word anymore. Where is it? Tell me. The vine power is right there. The olive tree flowing continuously with the, the Holy Spirit is right there. It is his promise for you to shine. But we're not. Maybe we got used to it. Maybe we just became religious as everybody else. This is it. We're good and criticized. Never about ourselves. So we need to consider again, brothers and sisters, the Holy Spirit in our lives. And I plea with you, please consider the Holy Spirit in your life above everything else. Above everything else. Unless he opens your eyes, you never understand this. Unless he opens your eyes, you can read all the other books in your entire life. You never understand life. I plead with you about the role of the Holy Spirit in your life. I'm not crazy. I'm talking about life. Life. And as it happens, what, uh, what uh, Zechariah saw was the reality of how weak the big mountain of Robo was. They were discouraged because of the enemies. They were discouraged because of this massive pile of stones in front of them. And they couldn't actually remove the stones. It was too, too much for that small group of former slaves to do it. But as the Spirit began to flow in their lives, and they began to see what was behind the, the big pile of, of stones, while well, they saw the end result of what God was doing in their lives, they got encouraged. And actually, it's quite uh, funny, to be honest, the way the angel talks to the mountain. The angel talks to the mountain and says... What are you, almighty mountain? It's a challenge. Who are you? Who do you think you are? This side of the ring is me, God almighty. But see, I think when we don't understand the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives, we tend to think that a mountain is bigger than God. We tend to think that all the problems we have, they are more, I don't know, important. They're stronger, they're powerful than God itself. 
I'm very sure that among us here this morning, many of us will say this when I face a big problem. I don't know if God can do it. Maybe because we look too much at the mountain. And we have to begin to speak to the mountains of our lives. Who are you? What are you? Because it's not by my own might or power, but the Holy Spirit will lead me to this conviction. That I can and I should have all the reasons to be more confident in my life. Not so depressed. I cannot surrender to every single hill that comes in front of me. There's a little stone in front of me. I said, oh no, God forgotten me. Maybe I forgot to draw from the Spirit. Maybe I forgot to actually come to Him and say, would you refill me? Would you fill my life with this fire for life? Because I will be able to say to the same mountain, mountain, who are you? What are you, mountain, compared to God's mighty power? Because, you know, twice in the Bible we see this. I'm not, I'm not creating this. Here, the angel of the Lord talks to the mountain and he says, What are you, mountain? So he talks to the mountain. In the New Testament, Jesus talks to a mountain. And he says, If you have a small little faith, you will tell this mountain, You be cast into the sea. So a man and a woman of faith, a mountain either will become flat or will be cast into the sea. But we can't see that, can we? Because maybe we're so accustomed, we're so used to rules and principles. And then the book doesn't say exactly how do I behave in front of a big mountain. Maybe I don't let the spirit talk to me. I know it all. I know all the answers. I'm not free, and the Spirit is not free to work in me because I know it all. You will become level ground, he says. You will become level ground. This big pile of mountain will become flat, and I will build my house. Do we believe that? Do we? Finally, he gives an assurance. The assurance is this. Those who despise the small beginnings, they will rejoice when the building is finished. And sometimes we despise the small beginnings. Uh, D. L. Moody, who's a preacher 120 years ago or more, he tells us the story that he was in his church, and, and during the service he noticed a Sunday school teacher was right there, and she was not caring for the the, the, the children in her classroom. After the service, he came to the Sunday school teacher and said, why are you not there with the children? And then the, the teacher said, you know, today all the children, they didn't come. There was just one little boy. So I said, oh, just one little boy. And he says, are you crazy? This one little boy, he said, could be John Knox could be Whitfield, could be John Wesley. But the problem is that we despise small beginnings. It's hard, isn't it, to remove one stone at a time. One stone at a time. It took them 20 years. They finished the building in the year 516, from 536 when they began. 20 years removing one stone at a time. One stone at a time. One stone at a time. Isn't it interesting how God does? Somehow to remind us that the world, Hollywood, you know, you blink and everything happens. People, they, they have fire in their hands and things happen just like that. But with God, he takes a prophet who says, you know, there's just a little cloud. And he says, you better run because this little crown will become pouring rain very soon. Isn't it interesting that God takes just a small little baby in a manger, just in, the, in, a, in a nowhere place called Bethlehem, and he says, you know, just, just a little beginning, just a little start, just the first cry of a little baby, and I'll put the world upside down with this little baby. But we despise. We say, you know, it's, it's just beginning. 
but God isn't there. It's quite interesting because he says, you know, those who despise. Why? It's quite interesting he says that because in Nehemiah, in the book of Nehemiah chapter 4, you don't have to go there, but some of the enemies, they were outside and they saw the Israelites rebuilding the temple and the walls. And they began to mock. They say, what? Are they building this little wall? Even a fox can jump over it. Do you think they are going to sacrifice again in that little temple of theirs? They're mocking. So the people cry out to God, and Nehemiah cries out to God and says, God, we are being despised. So here God gives the answer. You who are despised, you're still going to rejoice. I'm going to give you my joy, Jesus says, and no one can take it from me. I am going to. Regardless of what the world does or think, you can do it. I am going to do it. And then it's what he says. He says, the eyes of the Lord, the seven eyes of the Lord, they see it all. It's quite interesting. Because he says, maybe you despise the little beginning. Not God. He sees it and he approves it. There's the little boy, the little girl in the Sunday school by herself. God sees it. He approves it. And his eyes are right there. He says, I approve it. Not only I approve it, but I'm pleased with it. Ah, if we could, by the Spirit, come so close to God, so close to God, but maybe we could see through his lenses and we would be pleased as well to see what we see. Maybe we'd be less discouraged if we can come so intimate, so intimate. You know, brothers and sisters, the olive tree is right there in the vision, connected to the lampstand. Intimacy. If you could have this kind of intimacy that you could see life through God's lenses. I want to finish with this. Sometimes we, because we, we fail, we give up things. There's so many dreams here that you gave up. Maybe some of you are divorced. You gave up your spouse. Maybe some of you have no more friends. You gave up friendship. Maybe you had a dream to move to a different country. You gave up. Maybe you had a dream of a career, but you gave up. Because the pile was too big in front of you. The challenge was tremendous, more than you could follow. I have to say this to you. Number one, be filled with the Spirit. It's right there. I'm not, I'm talk, I'm not talking, I'm going to say this again. Some people there think be filled with the Spirit is, is to be crazy. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about to be filled with the Spirit. Live life that God has for you. Come very close to Him in your prayers. Jesus says, lock yourself at the door. And your father, who sees in secret, he will reward you. What a promise. Intimate at the, uh, behind the door. And maybe you say, but what about the, the, the dreams that I have in the past that they're gone now? Well, the text says, when everything is done, people will shout glory, grace upon grace upon grace. God's grace is overseeing our lives all the way through, from the very first stone, all the way, even knowing that sometime, from time to time, we're going to fail. We won't be able to remove certain stones of our lives. Grace of God will be right there for you. But don't give up. 